everyone. How are people feeling? Are you excited about this panel? Because I am. <laughs> I'm here today with two people that I admire a lot, and I'm super excited about the two journeys that they are embarking on. So I'd love us to start with like a little quick round of intros and um, maybe some sort of thinking on what the products that you're launching are all about. So why don't we start with you, Valentina? Hi, everyone. Super excited to be here. It's my first time at Slush and actually my first time presenting day on stage. So thank you to everyone who came. Um, a year ago, I started a company that is targeting the menstrual hygiene space. So we saw an opportunity to create a better tampon that's safer for users and performs in a more effective way. And more, more importantly, we noticed that nine out of 10 women globally experience period pain, yet the only medication that they have available to them is ibuprofen, which was never tested on women, was never designed for women, and is not supposed to be taken every month. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Andrea? Hey everybody, I am also new to Helsinki, my first time at Slush, and I built a company that is meant to help people learn about something that very few people ever really learn about, which is sexuality and pleasure. Uh, I grew up Filipino Catholic, and the only thing I was ever taught about sex was not to have it at all <laughs> until I was married. And I was also taught that I would go to hell if I were gay and all of these harmful things and in public school, it was the same. And right now, on the internet especially, it's either you know, Planned Parenthood or medical websites like WebMD or Pornhub and porn. Like that is the space that is currently online and we fill the space in the middle. So we make medically accurate information available to people globally about sexuality and pleasure to help them live their happiest, healthiest lives. Awesome, thank you. So operating in this field, um, I'm super excited both as a consumer and also as an investor. Obviously, I think it's sad that we haven't had more innovation in these fields for such a long time, but I'm also excited about the new generation of companies that are coming, and I think the two that you are running are the, the most exciting at the moment. Mm -hmm. So maybe you want to talk to us a bit about the upside of running a company in this field and creating products that you yourself are a user of, and sort of coming from your own stories. So we're in the tampon manufacturing space, um, which means that I get to spend most of my days with a bunch of white 50-year-old men in suits, which typically would be considered a disadvantage, but because I'm a 25-year-old Eastern European woman with an accent, I actually get to know a lot more about their industries than they would disclose to their counterparts. Um, so I'm never seen as a real fair competitor when I'm in the tampon manufacturing space, when I'm in tampon manufacturing meetings. Um, and I always find that as an interesting opportunity to actually dig really deep into the industry. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So sex is actually really a huge industry and it's not niche, it's not taboo, and it's, not, it's, it's actually something that um, I am told all the time um, is like this new and upcoming thing. And it's nuts to me. It's first of all projected to be over a hundred billion dollars by 2026 um, across you know, the, the market and right now big players like Amazon, major platforms won't touch it. So for me it just seems like such a huge opportunity. Um, I actually started my career in another sexy space, accounting software, um, which is also around like <laughs> money shame, sexual shame. Well, that's a good one. That's another it's panel. It's the shame <laughs> spectrum, right? And what because people have two shames, money and sex, right? And so what is really awesome about the upside of being in the space is we're in a blue ocean, um, which is you know, there's challenges to that, of course, and like I'm, you know, Valentina and I can talk all day about the advertising challenges, the structural challenges, the payments challenges. There's challenges across the way, but these are also opportunities. Yeah. And um, I would say both of us, we have customers who are obsessed with what we do. We, I don't struggle to recruit. Like people, you know, a lot of people who have experienced problems mm -hmm. with sexuality know the, how important it is to them. Yeah. And my mission is that Investing in this space and building a company in this space should be like any other wellness category. It should yeah. be like yoga, meditation, any of that, because it's massive, it's untapped, it's important, and it's world positive. Yeah, no, for sure. So the title of this panel, we're talking about taboos. So what are some of the situations that you have sort of 
bumped into where it's been difficult or conversations have been awkward or people have been uninformed? Mm. I think initially when I was fundraising, I noticed that I had about 15 minutes before the investors that I was speaking to started to feel extremely uncomfortable <laughs> by the amount of times that I mentioned tampon or the word vaginal canal. So I knew I had these 15 minutes in which I had to be super focused, super concentrated, and just relay my message before I was kicked out of the door. But if I <laughs> managed to have like a very stern face and talk about the financials and talk about the science behind my product, I could get male investors through those 15 minutes of pain and right. shame and discomfort and enter this new territory, which was very interesting because I had a lot of questions that were not very informed. I had questions around, why do you have a string on your tampon? I thought the tampon dissolves inside of your body. Why does someone need to take it out? But then at the same time, I had a lot of like, really honest and curious questions from male investors that really wanted to learn about my space and the category. So I think once you get through those 15 minutes of taboo and oh, I'm uh, not ready to talk about menstruation yet, um, then you enter this new space in which people are actually excited to learn about women's right. health and women's bodies and how to make women's lives better. Right. Yeah. And this change, I would say that the work that the menstrual reproductive fertility spaces have done has pushed and made it possible for O School to exist. So for example, in 2016, one billion dollars had been invested already in femtech, which mm. most of that was menstruation care, fertility, things that have to do with having babies. Because yeah. actually, like the way you look at society, the only acceptable reason to have sex is to be, have babies, obviously. But <laughs> the majority of the sex that all of us have is because it feels really good. Right? So being in the pleasure space is harder, I would say, than being in the fertility and like, you know. Baby making place. And, yes, yeah. right? Because, and people, investors, everyone has tried to be like, Andrew, just talk about, you know, talk about how to prevent pregnancy and STIs and stuff. But I'm like, we have nonprofits to do that. What I wanted to help everyone in the world do is close the orgasm gap, mm. right? Right now, straight women are having the fewest orgasms of any other group, mm. That's right? Incredible. And it's so bad. as soon as you start talking about people enjoying sex, it becomes taboo. <laughs> and that's for us the big barrier is that it's important and it's huge. And um, with investors, most of them haven't been educated about sex too. And so you get all of their insecurities, their lack of education. And so a lot of us, a lot of times, you know, Polly Valentina and I are educating our investors like this, you know, this is what a, you know, this is what a tampon string does. Like that's yeah. a hilarious story, but it's a big barrier because it's a waste of time. Yeah. You know, while we could be just closing the deal, we have to be like, hey, investor, like, let me educate you about basic anatomy. Yeah. And how do you go about finding investors that you know have like a, a, a bit of more understanding for the industry so you don't need to go all the way back and do the heavy education piece? Right. I don't think you really know until the first meeting. You can't, you can't really tell by an investor's brand or by who the partners there are, whether they're going to understand your topic or not, or whether they're going to be sympathetic to it. I think it's really in the first meeting that you find out, okay, this person cares about the space or understands it. Right. Yeah. What's, how, have you found any ways to do due you, diligence You go on to investor before? events and you say, hey, like, who do you know is the most open-minded person in your <laughs> investor groups? Like, no one puts on their angel list, like, I am, you know, I am this, like, I have this type of idea about sexuality. Like, it's not something that people are open mm -hmm. about. Um, Yet. Yeah. Yes. So usually yeah. it's like, I'm not going to tell you anything, but you should talk to this investor, and then usually they're open, yeah. and it's word of mouth. Um, I also kind of tend to like investors who like Blue Oceans, like Frontier Markets. Um, and for us, that has been really helpful because in the, in the end of the day, we, we don't always get invited into the social impact and the wellness and health communities as much as we should be. Yeah. You know? So maybe talk a bit about some of the tricks that you know, have worked in these conversations. So you mentioned coming back to the data and being very data driven. Mm. And I know in your education efforts, you actually have yeah, something so that I you're actually start to literally every investor meeting I've ever done by holding up uh, this. And so, so everyone, I, I wonder if anyone here can like yeah. identify what like this organ in the human body is. Um, but many medical doctors can't, and not a single in, like, investor I've ever met has ever been able to correctly identify it, and it's the clitoris. 
Um, it's an anatomical clitoris. This is the external part. This is the whole thing. And so I actually start every meeting with that just to, sh just to eliminate the objection. Like, everyone has sex ed. Everyone knows everything. Most people can't identify the organ that is responsible, who's solely responsible for pleasure. And that's, you know, that for a lot of people with clitorises require them to have orgasms. And but what year the... did we know when we mapped out, it wasn't, we haven't known about the yeah, clitoris so for Huff that Post, long. Like HuffPost wrote this great thing. Um, we put a man on the moon and invented the internet before we fully understood the clitoris. It yeah. wasn't until 1998, until yeah. an Australian <laughs> doctor thought it would be a good idea um, to know this organ in the human body. So that's, that's why we um, really further this education, because we should know about this, uh, like this is an organ in the human body that everyone should know about. Yeah. All right, so I'd love to know a bit more about your personal journeys and what sort of drove you to start your own company and get to the place where you are today. Like, how did the idea come up and where did you get the sort of energy from or who encouraged you or, yeah. Maybe I, you want to start, Valentina. I, I take some pleasure in telling the story in how I started a day because I think I'm the most unusual founder type. I didn't go to an Ivy League or an Oxbridge University. I didn't go to a private school. I didn't spend time in um, private equity. I didn't work for a law firm. Um, in fact, I did all of the wrong things. I dropped out of high school when I was 16. I um, did my university degree in only two years. Um, worked all kinds of odd jobs uh, before I had the idea for, for day. Um, and I don't have a medical background, I don't have a background in regulations or design engineering, so I know very little by background of the areas in which I'm very actively involved in today. So the way that I kind of had the idea for day is just by reading a bunch of research papers and being inspired by the properties of industrial hemp, which is a plant that we use in, in our product. So the fibers of industrial hemp are actually more absorbent than cotton, which um, allows us to make the tampon smaller. And the extract from the flower has analgesic and um, anti-inflammatory properties. So when I found out those two things, I just connected them and had the idea for one product. Um, and this concept of learning things through medical journals and just going on the internet and finding information on different areas in which you have curiosities um, stuck with me as I was building day. So the first tampon machine that we had, the first prototypes that I made were in a 3D printed mode and I looked up needle punching as a technology and used it in my first prototype. So I think we're super fortunate today despite all of the difficulties that women have fundraising or have in, in, in entrepreneurship, we are still super fortunate to live in the time where someone with all of the wrong things in their background can become a founder and can start their own company and can change the world in the way that they want to. Amazing. Amen. And you, Andrea, what's your background? So what? I went from accounting software, I built accounting software, and I was then a venture partner at 500 Startups. And um, kind of publicly, I was you know, traveling and investing, and I had started this accounting software. But privately, I was really struggling with my sexuality because I just shared that I grew up Filipino Catholic. I was in the closet sexually, and um, I married young uh, because I wanted to be the good Filipino daughter, right? So I did all those things. And so I was in this period of my life where I was changing my life, and I was, a v I was you know, in venture. And so O School really started because I needed it. I was Googling for things and it was like, ah, like it's just porn or Planned Parenthood, right? Like it's, it's really these two things. Mm. And then when I started to like talk to 500 about investing in it, everyone was like, no, 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 no. Like you can't, we can't really invest in that. And so I started to hear a lot of don't do this. I actually had people say, you're going to ruin your reputation, start another company in the finance space, yeah. right? And of course, that was like so, I was irresistible at that point. Um, so I started building side projects and I designed a prototype. I got an outsourced team of engineers. And then um, one of the former director of engineering at WebMD kind of saw me building this by myself and was like, you need help. <laughs> and so I, I ended up having this amazing team come together. And uh, that is how we've kind of become this search, really thinking about search because when you're in a shame category, People don't post on Facebook like, yo, who knows about erectile dysfunction? Or like, yo, <laughs> anyone dealing with vaginal dryness? They're not doing that. <laughs> They're going right to Google. And, and so we started to really develop our ability to reach people where they are. 
Um, but we reach it in their natural language because again, like I, what I was Googling, it was hard to know what to Google for, right? And yeah. so um, understanding exactly how people have these issues and exactly how to reach them and also not focusing too much on the super, like, like the super liberated audiences of like LA, San Francisco, New York, like we really focus on Midwest in relationship <laughs> people globally because frankly, sexually liberated people in the world are the niche, like that's niche, you know, but going abroad, like actually sexual shame is a massive af opportunity because yeah. I haven't met many people who don't have some aspect of that yeah. and who won't go through it. Um, and so that's how we decided to be the most trusted, medically accurate brand in sexual wellness. And um, it really came from, I, I, wanted to, I wanted another yeah. company in this space to do it, but no one would fund it. And so I was like, let's build it. Yeah, let's do it. And what are some of the tricks uh, for how to market a service that it, when it's hard to actually use the word you need to use in order to explain what it is? Oh, sure. I'm sure we both have stories. So yeah, yeah. at this point in time, like Facebook and Google are, make up so much of the ad spend. But yeah, it's hard. Currently, virtually every sexual wellness company, and I love Valentina's stories, but you cannot put even the most conservative, like me in this outfit with this clitoris is like banned. Too much. Right, yeah. too much. And it doesn't matter, you have to learn all of the rules and the algorithms and um, we make a, we, our business is based on our ability to navigate these conservative lines, so I can speak all day, but how do you, how do, you do CBD infused tampons? Damn. <laughs> <laughs> I think it forces you to be creative when you right. can't rely yeah. on traditional channels, when you can't just promote your posts on Instagram or on Facebook. You have to start Create your own, these. like you did. Right. <laughs> <laughs> start all of these like traditionally very unscalable things, like go to events and create events for your community and create lots of content for your community. And um, something that we do at days, we have three different events. We have one which is called Health for Breakfast, which we host in collaboration with large corporates like Facebook, Silicon Valley Bank. So we go to their offices and we give a informational session on a hot topic in women's health. So whether it's the vaginal microbiome or how different forms of contraception affect your hormonal balance throughout the cycle. The aim of the presentation is first to be utilitarian and provide um, utility and meaning to our audience and second, mention the day products and um, educate people about them as well. So that's how we're kind of avoiding the fact that um, if we go on Instagram and Facebook and we over rely on those, we're going to be at the mercy of algorithms and then right. have lots of ups and downs in our data and then sure. investors don't love that. Um, yeah. But to that point, a business built just on Facebook ads isn't that interesting of a business anyways, no. frankly. And so even, I see it as an opportunity to build better businesses than other D2C and other kind of consumer spaces where everyone's just relying on that Facebook because the more you spend on Facebook, the, the more expensive yeah. it becomes. And so by being creative, we actually lower the cost yes. of acquisition in our space. And so in that way, stigma and shame are, are again like, People think they're keeping us down, but they're making us stronger businesses overall. And so, for example, for us, you know, putting out an ad for a sexual wellness product, we don't have products yet. We plan to go into a marketplace and do that. So we have a lot of data experimentation mm -hmm. that we've done. And just putting up an ad for a vibrator, you're going after that very liberated market that I'm talking about. And it's very expensive over time to keep targeting that same group and try to sell them a vibrator. The market of people who know they want a vibrator, know they need mm. one, is actually quite small. Mm. So we go a step above that and we're like, hey, like, would you like to increase the romance in your marriage? You know, and we kind of go there, but the bidding and the competition for those are much lower, yeah. right? And so again, it's creativity, it's, it's also, um, understanding our customers' intent and problems yeah. and not just pushing them um, to try to, yeah. you know, understand our space because, again, it's not just about education, it's about de-education. It's about unlearning things that mm. people have been taught and you have to be a little sneaky to do that. Yeah. And frankly, the other space that has this is finance, is money, yeah. right? And so I learned a lot from that with accounting software. Oh, that's yeah. interesting. You applied some of the learnings from that into this one. That's no one would share an article about bankruptcy. No, right? yeah, it's kind of the most uncomfortable conversation probably. Right. And speaking of that, what are some of the user responses that you have received? Because what you're doing is that you're giving people information about things that they hadn't you know, been informed about and probably many of them are therefore grateful and excited and thankful and that's I think why you're creating these brands that are both built on trust and 
and also very generous brands because of all the information and the sort of hand-holding. So I'd love to hear some about the, the user love, the reactions that you've been given, if, if something stands out that you'd like to share. Yeah, so we invest a lot in our own content, which is part of the wider mission of day to provide um, meaningful women's health education. So. Um, in the same way in which many of us don't know what the clitoris looks like. We have no idea what uterine fibroids is or what endometriosis is or what symptoms to look out for, even though those are conditions that affect one in 10 women. And in the UK alone per year, they cost 2.5 billion pounds. Um, so something that we hear a lot from our consumers is that they, once they read one article on Vitos, this is our blog on yourday.com, um, they go down a rabbit hole of reading another and another and another and another. Um, and actually 25% of the people who learn about they learn about us because someone sent them a link uh, or someone told them about the, the content that we have on, a, on our website. So that's something we keep hearing. Cool. Yeah, that's cool. rewarding. What about you? Oh my gosh, so many first time orgasms, so many uh, people overcoming relationship issues. Like we, that, it's the best part of, I think, our businesses is people really struggle alone yes. in these problems. And when yeah. you make people feel less alone, that's a life changing thing. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you that someone who's never had an orgasm, when they have it, suddenly they're like, <laughs> What else is out there? And they're like, and then we help them with that. We're like, oh, you know, suddenly they want to explore. I mean, Fifty Shades of Grey came out, you know, which for better or for worse, there were a lot of new inquiries, new products, new, new, new energy in that. And yeah. so um, one of the things that we've created to help with this word of mouth problem that, um, I, that I'm so proud of is if anyone's ever ordered a sandwich, like at Whole Foods at a grocery store or a deli, and they've given you like a piece of paper, and you have to say, like, what kind of sandwich you like. Like, I don't like mayo, I like tomatoes, but no onions, right? We created that for orgasms. We created the orgasm order form. Um, we have multiple versions of it, but the idea is, like, what if you could just say, like, hey, it's like the left side in a counterclockwise yeah. motion for this much time, <laughs> and then hand it to someone. And we've seen, yeah, like, amazing engagement on that. And, and we've literally had T-Pain the rapper fill it out. Amazing. <laughs> and T-Pain the rapper filled out our orgasm order form and he was like, no one's ever asked me my favorite technique, you know? <laughs> and, and it was like, it was mind blowing for the entire O School team because yeah. we were like, this, this is someone who just bragged to us how many like people, how much sexual experience yeah. he had, but people aren't asked about that. And so we like to create experiences that transform that thinking yeah. and create conversation. Yeah. Awesome. I would love to hear if you have any thoughts or advice for the next generation of entrepreneurs that are thinking about starting companies within this field. What are some of the things that you should think about, prepare yourself for, remember? Yeah, I think it's super exciting that you and I were able to become entrepreneurs because imagine the next generation of women that are going, and men that are going to be inspired and become entrepreneurs right. themselves. But I wish I had a bit of a guidebook when I was starting around what are terms that you should expect in a term sheet and what are terms that you can accept in a term sheet and what you should push against or what is a shareholders agreement and what are the terms that you should have in there and, and what not. So things like not giving rights of first refusal to your first investor just because they were your first investor, um, being really careful with the amount and type of people that you invite to your board, particularly those that have a board seat because they will be with you forever. <laughs> and while your company scales, they may not scale at the speed at which you need them to. Being like knowing how to be a good manager, knowing the importance of investing in executive coaching early on. So that was one of the things that I was really pushed to do by one of my early investors who recommended that I get an executive coach and it's been really transformational as a first time founder, having someone that you can rely on and having the source of know-how. Um, and also you and I have spoken about this a lot, but professional athletes are expected to perform at the exact same level as entrepreneurs or entrepreneurs are expected to perform at the level of professional athletes, right? Like we get very little sleep. We our brains are working all the time, we solve these unsurmountable challenges and we climb mountains all day, but we don't have any forms of self-care. Like, 
a professional athlete may have three different coaches and a therapist and a masseuse. Um, and, and they know who, that part of the capabilities to perform at yeah. the time of the competition is to rest, mm -hmm. to get in shape. But I feel like we are running all the time. Right? Yeah. yeah. So that's something that I really, I try and practice more now and I wish I knew the importance of earlier um, that if you are going to perform at the level of professional athletes, you need to look after yourself as if you were one. Um, and the other one, you hear a lot, I heard a lot and I wish I listened that advice. Um, you need to triple your timelines and triple your budgets for everything that you do. <laughs> and then maybe you'll be on time and on budget. That's amazing. Uh, I'm such a fan of day and I think I have three pieces of advice I think for all entrepreneurs and I, I it's, it's great timing. I'm, I'm pu I have a book coming out on December 3rd. Yeah, like, tell us about called it. Called Sex Tech Revolution, The Future mm. of Sexual Wellness. And it's literally a love letter to all the next generation of entrepreneurs so they don't have to go through what we did, which is like blindly rocking into a space. And um, the, the three big things that I, I share with people is one, create a community of support. I, being a second time entrepreneur, I would say that was game changing for me because I could call so many people who can like help navigate that. And especially in sexual wellness, you need to call people because it, the rules aren't the same, right? And so, you know, being able to call other founders of other companies that I really respect was like absolutely key. And so I tell people make a community really like try to work for the best founder you know in the space first. Like I had the opportunity to co-found a company with someone who taught me so much. And so I tell people that, um, especially as a immigrant, you know, woman of color, founder myself, like I couldn't, you know, start full time till I raised money. It was just not possible for yeah. me. And um, my, my early entrepreneurial kind of experiences helped unlock O School um, for, for me. So. Yeah creating community is just so important for mental health and for just m making it through this road. Um, the second thing I would say is really like focus on like the customer acquisition problem is so huge in our space. And so I meet so many amazing products um, that want to come to market in sexual wellness. And I always say, okay, like let's really figure out how you're gonna reach this market because it doesn't work like selling makeup or fashion or a suitcase. You know, there's so many things that people, you know, want to bring to market and this one is, is really unique. And so just, and I love helping entrepreneurs with that in the space because yeah. it, it for me is the most gratifying to, you know, I want to reach billions of people. You know, there are billions of people around the world who need the products that we have, and it's our job to really bring that to scale. Yeah. Um, and the third one is exactly like what you said, self-care. And focusing on um, your own, like, self-development is absolutely been key. Uh, making time for everything, for meditation, for yoga, for pleasure, right? Uh, <laughs> I always uh, share that with people because it's important and we can oftentimes um, get lost, but the more that we invest in ourselves, we bring that back to the movements and um, we, need, we need to be kind of the living examples of what we wanna see in the world, which always doesn't happen, um, but for, for, for especially a company that is about sexual wellness, um, we really preach a lot about you know, self-care. Yeah. And I think in the femtech space, what I've seen so far, I love that everybody is so generous with sharing contacts and taking meetings, thinking of partnerships. It definitely feels like a community and everybody's interested in kind of elevating each other and doing good things together. We're kind of running out of time, but the last thing I wanted to ask, and maybe we can keep it short, is sure. like, the thing you're doing now, what are you most looking forward to bring to the next generation of yeah, teenagers out there that God. will grow up in a different world that you did? the ability to not waste time, energy, cognitive capacity to think about period pain or to think about, oh, has my tampon leaked? Can you see my tampon string? You know, growing up as a girl and having your first period is one of the most brain time consuming experiences because you're always like worried and self-conscious and in pain. Um, what I'm really looking forward to is just our product giving women the chance to not have to think about these things and kind of level out the playing field a little bit. Like before the three of us came out on stage, we you know, got our makeup done and our hair done. And that takes a while. Like that takes 45 minutes that, you know, men would typically spend maybe reading a book or on the phone with a business partner. So it's mm -hmm. very similar with the way that we look after our health. It's so time consuming. It's so expensive. 
Um, and what I really want to achieve with Day is provide services to women that are affordable and convenient and easy and designed by someone who uses those same services as well. Yeah. And you? I'm excited about building a future where the de facto sex education for the whole world is not pornography. <laughs> Amen. Um, because right now, <laughs> the average exposure to porn is between 9 and 10 years old. It's the yeah. average exposure to a mobile phone. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with porn. Um, there are lots of things wrong with porn, actually. But porn in itself is not the problem, because there can be great porn out there, but it's not sex education. That's like expecting young children to learn about, you know, uh, driving from Fast and the Furious movies, it's like not what we want. Yeah. Right? It's not reality, and it's driving tons of shame and, and yeah. mental health issues for an entire generation. The second thing I would say, nobody in this room, including myself, is not even ready for Gen Z. I speak at colleges all over the United States. One third of Gen Z know someone who uses gender non-conforming pronouns. Um, we are going to have to really reshape even our industries because you know, even talking about women's health, men's health, like we should be calling it reproductive health, which I'm trying to shift because you know, gender, sexuality, all of these things are changing. Yeah. And we, I think, have the opportunity to really be part of that change and support what the next generation is already leading. Yes. We're running out of time, but we could talk for hours. I want to say, Massive thank you to both of you for joining on stage today. Thank you for hosting. Best of luck. Thanks for the